Section 6.4 is about the inverse trigonometric functions and right triangles. In order to find an angle, if you already know the sine, cosine, or tangent of the angle, you can use something called an inverse sine, inverse cosine, or inverse tangent. And you studied this in geometry and in algebra 2 when you were trying to find missing angles in right triangles. Now, another, there are two different notations for inverse. One of them has to do with the little negative 1 symbol, and we've seen that before. For example, this said f inverse of x, even though it looks like it says f to the negative first power. Same thing with the sign with the little negative 1. That says inverse sign. The inverse functions are also sometimes called arc sine, arc cosine, and arc tangent. We kind of interchange them, however, we're pretty much going to stick with the notation that has the negative 1. Now, how does an inverse trig function work? Well, if you know that the sine of pi over 6 is 1 half, then the inverse sine of 1 half must be pi over 6. Same works whether you're in radians or degrees. If we said that the sine of 30 degrees was 1 half, because pi over 6 is 30 degrees, then the inverse sine of 1 half could also be said to be 30 degrees. What answer you get in your calculator will depend on what mode you're in. If you're in degree mode and you do an inverse sine, you would get an answer in degrees. If your calculator is in radian mode and you do an inverse sine, the answer you will get will be in radians. Now remember, your calculator won't say pi over 6. It'll give you whatever the decimal equivalent of 3.14159 divided by 6 is. Since you're probably going to be doing some of these problems on your calculator rather than trying to reason them out, we need to talk about the kinds of answers you're going to get on your calculator. The calculator gives something called the principal values. Now the principal values are going to restrict the range or the outputs you're going to get when you use the inverse trig function. So for example, sine is only going to give you answers between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. That means it's only going to give you answers that are in the first and fourth quadrants. As well as tangent. Tangent will only give you answers between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. Or in degrees, it would give you an answer between negative 90 and 90. Cosine however, is going to give you an answer between 0 and pi. That means if you do an inverse cosine on your calculator, the calculator will only spit in an answer between 0 and 180 degrees, so something in the first or second quadrants. So if you do A on your calculator using the inverse sine function, um, one of the things I want to remind you is if you're using a calculator with the old operating system on it, you need to be cautious of how you type it in. You need to make sure that you close the parentheses around the 3 before you put in the divide by 2, but that only matters if your calculator has the old operating system. Now, what mode should you be in to do this? I recommend that you be in degree mode, because if you get the answer in degrees, you can always change the answer back to radians. So if you're in degree mode and you do the inverse sine of square root of 3 over 2, the calculator is going to spit out to you 60 degrees, which you can tell me is pi over 3. Now let's do b, the inverse cosine of negative 1 half. Remember, it's, only, it's going to give you some answer between 0 and 180, so don't be surprised when it does this. So if you do this in your calculator, as long as you're in degrees, it's going to tell you the answer is 120, which in radians is 2 pi over 3. 
and then the inverse tangent of 1. If you plug that into your calculator in degrees, it's going to give you an answer of 45 degrees, which is pi over 4. Now these make sense. Think about it. Uh, this first problem was a positive sign. Well, if the range is restricted to the first and fourth quadrant, signs are positive only in the first quadrant, so you better get an angle in the first quadrant. For B, since we wanted to find an inverse cosine of negative one-half, what kind of an output would give you negative one-half? Well, only cosines in the second quadrant are negative, so it makes sense that we got an angle that's in the second quadrant. And for the inverse tangent of one, tangents, since the tangent gives you an output in either the first or fourth quadrant, tangents are only positive in the first quadrant, so we expect it to get an answer in the first quadrant. I will try to tell you what mode I'd like you to be in when you're doing these problems. Example two, this is a strictly calculator problem. When you have answers that are just integers or they're in decimals, you're probably better off being in radian mode. But again, I'll try to remind you to tell you which mode I would like you to be in when you do these problems. So change your calculator to radian mode. And let's figure out what the inverse sine of 0 0.71 is. Well, you're going to get a decimal. You should get approximately 0 0.78950. The inverse tangent of 2 should give you 1.10715. The inverse cosine of 2, however, should give you an error message on the calculator. And I believe it should actually say domain error. That's because the domain for both sine and cosine has a restriction. The domain of sine and cosine is restricted between negative 1 and positive 1. Any numbers bigger than 1 or smaller than negative 1 don't exist, and they'll give you an error message. However, tangent, when we talk about the graphs of these trigonometric, trigonometric functions, you'll understand better why the domains and ranges are what they are. But for now, I'm just going to tell you the domain for tangent is all real numbers. Example 3 is an example that you should have done in both geometry and algebra 2, so we're going to go through it very quickly. I'm going to find the measure of angle theta in the figure. Now, my opinion, the best way to deal with a problem like this is to be in degree mode. So how am I going to find theta? I have to determine which trig function to use in order to find it. This is usually what I do. Since theta is marked, the 10 and the 50, I'm going to label them as opposite adjacent or hypotenuse. 10 is the side opposite theta. 50 is the hypotenuse. That's going to tell me I should use sine. So sine theta is equal to opposite over hypotenuse. Then to find theta, we're going to use an inverse sine. And then I'm just going to plug this into my calculator to find out that it's approximately 11.5 degrees. Let's do a practical example. A 40-foot ladder leans against a building. If the base of the ladder is 6 feet from the base of the building, what is the angle formed by the ladder and the building? Let's draw a picture. So here's my building. And there's a ladder leaning against it. It said the base of the ladder, so here the base is the bottom of the ladder, is six feet from the base of the building. And we'll just assume that the building makes a right angle with the ground. And then it also told me that the ladder is 40 feet, so the, the length of the ladder is 40 feet, so it goes there. They want to know the angle formed by the ladder and the building. Well, which angle in the triangle is that? It's actually this one up here. Sometimes when we do trig problems, we automatically assume that it's the bottom angle. But it isn't always, is it? All right, now we have to determine which trig function we're going to use to solve this. So now that we know where theta is, 
Let's label the two given sides of the triangle as adjacent, opposite, or hypotenuse. Well, 6 is opposite the angle, and the latter is actually the hypotenuse. So we must be using sine to solve this problem. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse. So theta must be the inverse sine of 6 over 40. I plug it into my calculator, and I find out that the angle is approximately 8.6 degrees. A lighthouse is located on an island that is two miles off a straight shoreline. Express the angle formed by the beam of light and the shoreline in terms of the distance d in the figure. So here's the lighthouse over here, and it shines a beam of light this direction. The lighthouse is two miles from the actual shoreline, which is over here. Now, we know two of the sides of the triangle. It's just we don't actually know the numeric value of D, but that's okay. Let's ignore the fact that I don't know the numeric value of D. If I want to write a trig function for theta, this is the side opposite, and D is the side adjacent. So the trig function that I would use would be tangent. So tangent of theta is equal to opposite over adjacent. To find theta, you would do an inverse tangent of 2 over d. And that is an expression that we can use to find the angle between the beam of light and the shoreline. Find all the angles theta between 0 and 180 degrees satisfying the given equation. Let's start with A. The equation is the sine of theta is equal to 0 0.4. Well, if you're going to solve for theta, the first thing you're going to do is an inverse sine. So theta is the inverse sine of 0 0.4. Plug it into your calculator, and again, put it in degree mode, because if I want you to put it in radians, then you can take the degrees and change it back to radians later. So you plug it into your calculator, and the calculator spits out 23.6 degrees, which is in quadrant 1. Well, this is a positive value. And not only are signs positive in quadrant 1, but they're also positive in quadrant 2. So how am I going to find the other answer if the calculator only gives me one answer? That's not too bad. You know that 23.6 is going to be over here somewhere. Oops, let me actually make that look like 23.6 degrees. There must be some angle over here with the same reference angle as 23.6. Well, 23.6 is the reference angle. Remember, the reference angle is the number of degrees between the terminal ray and the x-axis. So how do I find the angle in the second quadrant that has the same reference angle. Well, all you have to do is 180 minus 23.6, which is going to give you 156.4 degrees. So those are my two angles that their sine is equal to 0 0.4. All right, let's do this again. We want to find all the angles between 0 and 180 satisfying cosine theta equals 0.4. What are you going to do? Theta is equal to the inverse cosine of 0 0.4. The calculator spits out the answer, 66.4 degrees. Is there another angle with that same uh, cosine value? Well, just a reminder. In the unit circle, all students take calculus. Signs may be positive in the first and second quadrant. Cosines are positive in the first and fourth. Well, they wanted the angles between 0 and 180. There can't be an angle between 90 and 180 that gives me a cosine of 0.4, because otherwise it would be negative 0.4. So this one only has one answer. I want to find the cosine of the inverse sine of 3 fifths. And there are two ways of going about doing this problem. Here's the first way. 
I'm going to start with the stuff inside the parentheses. This inverse sine of three-fifths is the same thing as saying the sine of some angle is three-fifths. So if I draw myself a nice little triangle here, and I'll call this theta, if the sine of theta is three-fifths, then I know the side opposite, and I know the hypotenuse, which means the adjacent side must be four, because isn't that a three, four, five triangle? Absolutely. And that's probably the one Pythagorean triple you remember offhand. So now, if I've got this nice triangle, how do I find the cosine of theta? Well, then the cosine must be 4 over 5, and that would be the final answer. Well, there's another way that I could have done this. Remember, because the inverse sine is 3 fifths, that means the sine of theta is 3 fifths, I could have used my little sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta equals 1 formula. Because the sine of theta is 3 fifths, so I could have done 3 fifths squared plus cosine squared theta equals 1 and solve this for cosine. Now, they didn't tell me what quadrant I'm working in, uh, so we'll just assume we're working in quadrant 1 unless they tell us otherwise. So I get 9 over 25 plus cosine squared theta equals 1. And then I subtract 9 over 25 from 1, and I'm going to get cosine squared theta is equal to 16 over 25. So now i got to take the square root, and I'm going to get plus or minus 4 over 5. And like I said, we're just going to assume we're in the first quadrant, in which case the answer would be positive 4 over 5. Which method should you use to do a problem like this? Doesn't matter. As a matter of fact, you could have just plugged this one in your calculator. You could have typed in cosine, inverse sine, 3 fifths, hit enter, and then it would have told you 0.8, which if you hit math enter enter, is 4 fifths. Write sine of the inverse cosine of x and tangent of the inverse cosine of x as algebraic expressions in x for the domain of x being between negative 1 and 1. I'm going to do this in a similar fashion to what I did in the previous problem. I'm going to start with what's in the parentheses, where the inverse cosine of x is the same thing as saying the cosine of theta equals x, which is x over 1. So I'm going to draw me a triangle. And I'll call this theta. Well, if the cosine of theta is x over 1, that means adjacent is x and the hypotenuse is 1. So what's the side opposite theta? Well, let's use the Pythagorean theorem. I'll call this question mark for right now. So question mark squared plus x squared must equal 1 squared. So question mark squared must equal 1 minus x squared because 1 squared is 1. So the question mark must be the square root of 1 minus x squared. Well, now I can tell you what the sine is. So the sine must be the square root of 1 minus x squared over 1. Since this has the co inverse cosine of x also, same triangle, same side opposite, but now I want to know what the tangent is. Well, the tangent is opposite over adjacent. And so there is my expression for tangent.